So even, as I said, even honest liberals don't trust Yan me anymore. And, you know, most academic sources won't use um, defector testimonies. But there have even been articles published in liberal outlets criticizing Yan me, which you wouldn't think they would do. Uh, but this is how bad it's gotten or how, you know, blatant, glaring the contradictions in her story actually are. Um, so this Guardian article is actually really good, really good. And I can tell why this author published it, even though, you know, they're a pro, um, pro British or pro US liberal for the most part. Um, but this is by someone who researched the DPRK and DPRK defectors for years. But in doing so, they lost all the, their trust in the defector testimonies. They realized, you know, the contradictions became so glaring after doing the research that they couldn't ignore them. Um, so they also talk about in this article, U.S. sanctions that have been placed on the DPRK with the explicit justification of these defector testimonies, right? So we have to do this. We have to put these new sanctions on North Korea. Look at what this defector said. Look at the testimony that they gave. So, you know, maybe people think I'm exaggerating when I say that Yanmi's rhetoric encourages, you know, more sanctions and, and more U.S. imperialism towards the DPRK. But defector testimonies are explicitly being used to craft U.S. policy. Right, that's admitted to by the U.S. You know, that's what they use as justification to push these things through Congress, um, which is something that's talked about in here. This article also talks about the cash incentives that exist um, for defectors. Again, a lot of this is facilitated by these brokers and facilitated by the South Korean intelligence agency, um, which we should all watch loyal citizen to Pyongyang. Um, as I said, the economic conditions, as I said earlier, the economic conditions in South Korea aren't great, um, which is how we've gotten amazing movies like Parasite and Squid Game that are highly critical of capitalism and South Korean capitalism in particular. Um, so people are incentivized to become defectors, to get these cash incentives for telling these stories. Um, and this article, this Guardian article, says that they can get paid up to 50 or i mean from 50 to 500 dollars an hour for these stories you know so they're not saying they're all made up but the incentive to just make up a story and make up a story that sounds way more heinous and crazy than everybody else um than every other defector so that you can get on tv and become a celebrity like yanmi um that incentive is there you know <laughs> why not if you're in poverty, you know, and you can't pay for your mom's medical bills um, and you're, you're struggling to get by every day under capitalism. And then there's this TV show that'll pay you 50 to $500 an hour to just make up a, a heinous story about the DPRK. Of course, there are going to be people who do that. And that's, you know, a big reason there have been 20,000 um, defectors since 2010 alone. Um, although like the loyal citizens of Pyongyang story shows or the movie shows, there's a lot of people who regret it, right? There's a lot of people who second guess themselves. There's a lot of people who are now suing, uh, South Korea, the government and the intelligence agencies because, um, they defected and then weren't given what they were promised or, you know, life under capitalism wasn't what they thought it was going to be. Um, so, you know, this is part of, I've learned a lot of lessons, um, since we started Midwestern Marks, mostly how easy it is to be a grifter, you know, how once, you know, being a political pundit or commentator, someone who talks uh, to people, once that becomes how you make part of your income, once it becomes part of your job, you know, how you sustain yourself and produce your means of subsistence, there's so much incentive to be a grifter. Right? There's so much incentive just to say whatever's popular, to say things that are controversial, whatever is going to bring in clicks and views. Um, so I definitely understand the incentive uh, that there is to be a defector and make up lies. Um, but, but that's all the more reason you know, to take them with a grain of salt and not believe them because of the financial incentives that exist to lie. Um, and like I said, yanmi has been telling – she's – got her start telling the story um, 
whether truthful or not, or a stretch of the truth, stories from her own life, you know, at least claiming that all of these things happened to her. But because her, her income is tied to telling these stories and talking bad about NK, because that's how she produces her means of subsistence or how that's, that's how she gets the money that she needs to survive under capitalism, she needs to find new stories, right? Eventually, you'll run out of stories about your own life. Um, and she's already been caught, you know, mixing up her stories and contradicting herself. So since she's been out of North Korea since 2007, now she just needs to pick up other stories, pick up other stories from other people or pick up stories she's fed by um, the NGOs who sponsor her. So she needs to constantly come up with new stuff if she's going to survive, if she's going to make an income. Um, so that's how I mean, that's just how the structure of capitalism, the capitalist system itself, you know, forces a lot of people into the situation, forces a lot of defectors um into this situation or, or offers them money to lie about the dprk um so there have been a few other good articles um you know quote unquote liberal articles or western media articles um debunking Yanmi. there's a couple of good ones from the diplomat that people can check out if they want um so i'm just showing you this to show you that it's not just me this ain't just me being a crazy tanky, you know, all you have to do is a little bit of research on this stuff and you'll find even liberal sources criticizing her um, for mixing up and contradicting the story about her mom and stuff like that. The strange tale of Yanmi Park, a high profile North Korean defector has harrowing stories to tell, but are they true? North Korean defectors and their skeptics. Some skeptics are publicly doubting the horrific stories being told by North Korean defectors. You know, so this has even become a thing in Western media um, where you're not allowed to question that the DPRK is this authoritarian dictatorship where Kim Jong-un kills all your puppies. Um, so this writer actually, uh, this one or this one, I can't remember which one, but they met with Yanmi before they published this critical piece. So they actually met with her and talked to her, um, but that didn't help their trust at all. Um, they, they still detail all the inconsistencies in her stories. And the way they do so is referencing earlier episodes of that South Korean TV show, Now On My Way, Coming to See You. You know, so there are episodes when Yanmi was living in South Korea from, I want to say from 2009 to 2014, where she was on this TV show where all they do is tell horror stories from the DPRK. Um, and they have defectors fed to them by South Korean intelligence um, so that they can blast these stories about the DPRK um, across the airwaves. Um, but there are inconsistencies uh, between what Yanmi said on that show and then what she said when she came to the U.S., right? And she was targeting a different market, tar or talking to a different audience. So it makes sense that her, her story would change, you know, based on the audience she's talking to. If, you know, this is mostly an act and if the stories are a stretch of the truth or not truthful. Um, so the stories constantly change her, her dad's imprisonment, the way she talks about that constantly changes um, her mom's imprisonment, the reason why they were arrested, how long they were arrested, how they were treated. Um, one of the more blatant ones people have pointed out is she says that she crossed mountains, like three mountains a day to escape um, the north. But there are no mountains at all um, surrounding the place that she lived. Um, and based on the path that she said she followed to leave, there are no mountains on that pass. Um, she said that her mom's execution, um, or her mom was executed in a stadium. And this has been debunked by a lot of sources on the ground um, and Western liberal sources who study the DPRK. Um, so I don't know where Yanmi came up with the stadium execution. She must have been thinking of uh, Augusto Pinochet, the U.S.-backed dictator in Chile who executed 20,000 socialists in a, in a stadium. You never hear about that in Western media, though. Apparently, Pinochet is a dictator who's all right because he was pro-U.S. Um, the only dictators the U.S. Um, doesn't like are ones who go against the U.S.'s economic interests. Um, Yan, I mean, these are just the most blatant lies that you'll find in every Western media source that I'm listing now. But Yanmi said that they ate grass to survive. Uh, I don't even know if you can get nutrients in grass or if that's even possible. But her mom, her mom literally said that's not true. Um, they were never so poor that they had to eat grass, although things did get tough in the 90s when, like I said, the Soviet Union collapsed and the DPRK couldn't trade with the rest of the world anymore. 
But that's because of the U.S. sanctions. That's because of the U.S. sanction regime and the fact that the U.S. destroyed their infrastructure with bombs um, 40 years prior. Um, so Yanmi herself is from a, a pretty rich family. Um, she's often, she's even been called the Paris Hilton of North Korea. Um, she, she said multiple times that her father would criticize the Kim family all the time and blame all the problems in the country on the Kim family, which is funny that she says her father would do that, even though she says also everybody's getting spied upon. You're never allowed to criticize the Kim family. Um, but she says that the masses would never agree with her father criticizing the Kim family. You know, most of them would disagree with with her dad. Um, and you could say that all the masses are brainwashed. All the masses, you know, are just being controlled by Kim Jong Un. And that's why they won't criticize their their country and their system. Or we can look at the class character of this. So Yanmi's from a wealthy, rich family in the DPRK during a time when they're trying to construct socialism, trying to build a socialist society and class struggle is ongoing. It makes sense that a wealthy capitalist would hate that socialist construction. You know, any capitalist would hate a system that they're not dominating, that they're not in control of, that doesn't work for the accumulation of their own wealth, but works for common prosperity, especially if they were a wealthy capitalist before. And it makes sense that the masses would disagree with that capitalist. You know, we don't really care if you don't like our socialist construction, right? Of course, you don't like our socialist construction. It goes against your own individual interests. You know, but we're trying to create a society that works for the masses, you know, not just for the capitalist class. You know, so you also have this class character where um, Yami was raised in a, a wealthier family who likely lost status, wealth and power because of the socialist revolution. Um, and they were their opinions about the, the system were likely rejected by most of the masses who support their system. Um, so there was a liberal scholar who studies the DPRK who said executions only happen, only usually happen for large political crimes um, or human trafficking. So he denied that this execution of Yanmi's mom would have happened because um, Yanmi claimed that her mom was killed for like watching a TV show or something. Um, that was one of her claims. Like I said, the story always changes, but um, North Korean scholars, even, you know, non-communist scholars have debunked that and said, really, people are only executed for, you know, like treason, huge political crimes, spying or human trafficking. So sorry, Andrew Tate, don't go to North Korea. Um, so her mom said once, I'm just picking out all the most interesting stuff from these two articles. Her mom said once that um, Yami wasn't even aware of the atrocities in the DPRK until she started working for the TV show, now on my way coming to see you or whatever it's called. And at this point, she became more aware of all the atrocities going on. So isn't that an interesting way to say it? <laughs> Once Yanmi started working for this TV show that's overseen by Western NGOs and South Korean intelligence, then she became aware of the atrocities in North Korea and started talking about them. But I thought all these atrocities just came from her own experience. Right. I thought this was what she witnessed and she was just talking about them on this TV show. How did she only become aware of all the atrocities in the dictatorship once she started working for this pro-Western imperialist TV show? Um, so, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff in that article. Uh, that article also details where Yanmi's direct funding comes from. So we were talking about the NGO industrial complex earlier that basically starts doing imperialism and imperialist propaganda like that um, as soon as a, a socialist or democratic government comes to power in a country the U.S. is trying to exploit. Um, but she works directly for NGO or for the NGO Liberty North Korea. Oh, no, sorry. That was um, one of the old NGOs that she worked for and one of the NGOs that often funds her speaking engagements. So recently she gave a talk. Um, a well-paid uh, speech for Liberty North Korea. But today she works for a libertarian organization called the Atlas Foundation, right? So once she started working for these NGOs and the NGO industrial complex and, and the corporate media, she became aware of the atrocities in North Korea. Hmm. But she wasn't aware of them before, even though she lived there and apparently lived through these atrocities. Seems a little sketchy. I would be willing to bet Liberty North Korea and Atlas Foundation, these Western NGOs, 
had something to do with Yanmi's opinions about the DPRK changing. Um, the article also mentions a libertarian radio that she gave a talk to when she was in San Francisco. Um, she also worked for another libertarian organization in South Korea when she was still there called the Freedom Factory. So that would have been actually the NGO um, who she started working for right away um, after she left uh, North Korea and then after she left China in 2009. Um, and when her mom said she became aware of the atrocities in North Korea that she supposedly lived through, um, that's when she started working with the Freedom Factory. So I'm sure this libertarian think tank called the Freedom Factory would never lie or, you know, never influence the media or, or do propaganda, but seems a little bit sketchy. And now she started her own organization in New York that you can all donate to via PayPal. So if you want to support Yami and what she's doing, you can give her your own hard earned money too. Um, and this article, the diplomat articles say that these lies are dangerous. And the reason they're publishing this article is because the lies can skew public perception of real defectors. Right. So there are real defectors who leave and, and talk about the atrocities of the DPRK. Um, and if you have fake defectors like Yanmi Park, who have contradictions in their stories, this is harmful to the stories of real defectors. But the real reason it's dangerous, the real reason these defectors are propped up and, you know, so much money is spent by these NGOs and think tanks to prop them up is because they're used to justify U.S. sanctions and murderous regime change efforts. As I said earlier, you know, Congress literally put new sanctions on um, the DPRK with the explicit justification for them being some defector testimonies that were later proven false, that were later proven to be completely untrue, even by Western sources. So Congress and U.S. policy or Congress will craft U.S. policy. Um, based on defector testimonies or, you know, they'll really craft policy based on their own economic interests or the economic interests of their donors. Um, but they'll justify them with these defector testimonies. And these defector testimonies get U.S. citizens to support sanctions and all of these horrible things, which are actually leading to human rights abuses in the DPRK, which are actually decreasing the, you know, standard of human rights and the, um, the standard of living in the DPRK. So the propaganda just, I mean, blames every bad thing in the country on Kim Jong-un while never talking about sanctions and U.S. involvement, while at the same time playing the double function of getting Americans to want more sanctions on the DPRK, weaponizing their compassion. I care so much about the DPRK, but I think we should surround them with our military and make sure they're not allowed to trade. Like, it sounds pretty contradictory when you say it out loud, but that's what the majority of this country believes because of this nonsensical propaganda and the way it's designed. Um, so this is why, like I said, these NGOs do this. This is why they spend so much money on this. Um, this is why there are so many brokers in South Korea and China um, who obviously these brokers probably um, in China, there's probably been an effort to, to get rid of these brokers, but um, this is why there's so many people who try and lure defectors over the border, offer them money, um, so that they be can become successful celebrity defectors, just like Yanmi. And, you know, earlier I said that no academics or at least serious academics take these, uh, take these yes. defector stories yeah. serious, but there is, there is one remaining academic who, you know, either hasn't done the research on Yanmi and the contradictions in her stories and, you know, how these defector testimonies are propagated, um, or they just don't care. The only remaining academic who takes South Korean defector testimony seriously, Jordan Peterson, who interviewed Yanmi uncritically with zero pushback, with zero prior research, you know, into potential lies or contradictions in Yanmi's story. Peterson, the great academic that he is, the one remaining academic who takes defector seriously, he just let her come on his podcast and say whatever she wanted and then believed it hook, line, and sinker 100%. Just dropping by to say, Heart, 
and solidarity. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Molly. Thank you so much for that super chat. Really appreciate it. We will keep up the great work. Sorry if I missed any super chats while I've been doing this segment. I've been, um, my head's been in the game. Um, but either way, here's Yanmi Park telling the the horrors of the DPRK on on the podcast of the wise and powerful Jordan Peterson. And then they close me back. And then it literally from our passport to the bathroom, there were like piles of human bodies piled up. And you see children like chasing the rats, eating just rats, even human eyes first. And then children catch these rats and they eat and they somehow die from I don't know what it is. Then rats eat the children back. So this cycle of us eating rats and they eat us back is going to continue and continue. Yeah, and you said that was happening in the hospital. You also mentioned it. Gosh, he's smart. That's definitely happening in, in every North Korean hospital. There's bodies piled up to the ceiling. They never get rid of them for some reason. And, you know, nobody ever complains about the smell either, I guess. And the rats are eating people, and then people in the hospital eat the rats. That's the North Korean hospital diet. You know, and you might be saying, you know, how is that even possible? You know, that doesn't even make sense that there would be bodies piled up in the hospital or, or that, you know, it's possible for rats to eat people and then people eat the rats. It doesn't even make sense at all. You know, but Jordan Peterson doesn't seem skeptical at all you know he's he's a really smart guy you know and he doesn't see any problem with this story he just goes yep yep that sounds right in the hospitals mm -hmm. so i'm gonna believe this story too because he is the greatest wisest public academic of our time um, and he thought this story was true without researching it at all or being critical of it at all so um, thank goodness there's one good academic left who takes serious these defector testimonies. Thank you, JP. Another great stream, Eddie. Well done. Kai Pai. Thank you, Tom. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much um, to our New Zealand comrade, Tom, for the super chat. So somebody said jo uh, Yanmi Park was on the Joe Rogan podcast. Also true. She was on the Joe Rogan podcast, Spreading Nonsense, the most popular podcast in the country. And obviously, Joe Rogan isn't skeptical of her claims. It's freaking Joe Rogan. I like watching Joe Rogan's shows sometimes, but he's far from being an academic and he's a meathead. Um, and he'll just like kind of excitedly believe anything he hears that sounds interesting. Um, but I just thought this one was better, the Jordan Peterson podcast, because like I said, no academics or no scholars have taken defector testimony serious for a long time because they understand where they come from. But here you have Jordan Peterson <laughs> just like, yep, this is all true. Yeah, this is all true. Here, keep it coming. Keep it coming. I'm not going to do any background research on this or, or be critical at all. Um, and it just shows how much of a fraud Peterson is from an academic perspective. I mean, that was revealed in the Zizek debate for sure when he didn't understand what Marxism was uh, at all, um, despite all his claims that he, you know, Marxism's evil and he debunked Marxism pretty much. He probably just read the Communist Manifesto, which is like 30 pages and called it a day. But I thought this was another great example of how much of a fraud Peterson is, right? And how any, you know, academic or, um, well-researched criticism against him can just blow a lot of his arguments apart. Um, so there was a tweet that kind of went viral on viral for like tanky Twitter, I guess um, from radio free Amanda, who's great. Um, everyone follow radio free Amanda. She has good YouTube videos too. She said still laughing about North Korean defector Yanmi Park on Jordan Peterson's show claiming children there resort to eating rats, then die from eating rats, then the rats eat their carcasses, thus continuing a never-ending cycle of rats and children eating each other. American propaganda has no chill. <laughs> right? Like, this is the, the kind of lie that Jordan Peterson's propagating. Like, I feel like if I said this at, like, a, I don't know in a middle school cafeteria in the United States. If I said, you know, in at the hospitals in the DPRK, 
The children eat rats, then die of some unknown disease from eating the rats, and then the rats eat them, and it's a never-ending cycle of rats eating people. I feel like those middle schoolers would be like, that doesn't sound real. That doesn't sound true. Who told you this, and have you investigated their claims? <laughs> but, you know, Jordan Peterson's podcast is not even close to the level of a middle school cafeteria, so we couldn't expect that from him the greatest and wisest public academic that capitalism has produced. Like, it's not just that Peterson failed to research Yami Park and the contradictions in her story that have been proven. It's like he doesn't even have common sense, right? You don't even need to research Yami and all the holes in her story and all the criticisms against her to know that this story isn't true. Just use common sense, like, there's no reason that anybody around the world, regardless of whether they're in North Korea or not, would leave, you know, giant piles of, of rotting carcasses in their hospitals, right? They would at least take them and put them somewhere. And it's physically impossible for, you know, humans to live off a diet of rats while rats also live off a diet of humans. Well, I don't even know why I need to say that, but that's the point we're at with imperialist propaganda and with the, the capitalist academy where we have these public intellectuals who will gobble up imperialist propaganda, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, no matter how much it contradicts, you know, what common sense would tell you. So it's hard to explain how much of a joke Jordan Peterson is from like an academic perspective, but he is just the laziest, the laziest public intellectual ever, ever. And I'm sure at this point, as I said with Yanmi, I'm sure he's tied to his public profile. His public profile, putting out these videos and doing these speaking engagements, especially since he left his job, is how he makes his money. Right. So he's less of an intellectual at this point, less of someone who does research and looks into these things, and more someone who's like, oh, I'll have Yanmi Park on my podcast. It'll get two million views when she talks about the never ending cycle of rat eating that she made up or that the NGOs who sponsor her made up. Um, she also says during this Peterson interview, I believe that she woke up during surgery once. So she was getting surgery and she admits that the surgery and the healthcare is free in North Korea, which is hilarious. And wouldn't that be nice for Americans where 60% of our country experiences medical debt? You know, that's not a dictatorship, though. That's not a dictatorship of the hospital systems and the pharmaceutical corporations who who steal your wealth. No, no, no. Um, North Korea is a dictatorship because their people get free health care and they're in charge of the health. The, the masses are in charge of the health care system. So she tells a story about how she woke up from surgery and then like somehow blames that on Kim Jong Un. Like, so you were getting free surgery. And then you woke up in the middle of it and that's Kim Jong Un's fault. And that's a. a um, example of how much of a dictatorship this country is. And I mean, maybe that happened and maybe it's because they had to, you know, didn't have anesthesia or the correct medicine to put her to sleep during surgery. But the U S sanctions on North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, all these countries have been proven to prevent them from that. It's been proven that the sanctions prevent these countries from getting sufficient medical supplies and that this leads to death in the death of children, in the death of people who are reliant on certain medical um, procedures in order to live. So again, even if that story is true about the anesthesia, you should be advocating against U.S. sanctions that prevent this country from getting the sufficient or getting sufficient medical supplies while trying to provide free health care to their people. But instead, you know, Yanmi and Peterson and all these goofballs are justifying more U.S. sanctions, calling for more U.S. sanctions, calling for another U.S. intervention at points. So it's just so inverted. It's such an inversion of reality.